You you know what, Sam? I every time that I put a bathroom in D and D, because I'm always saying that there's no bathrooms in D and D, not nearly enough bathrooms. My players loot the damn thing. Okay, look, Dan Schneider. I didn't know that like you needed a bathroom in a D and D campaign. I took those kind of like a like a TV show. You don't need to see characters going to the bathroom, right? Like. <laughs> Well, you know, what if the monster's hiding in the bathroom? I mean, you know? yeah, if if there's a reason to describe a bathroom, sure. But like, <laughs> I mean, pretty sure there were uh, was a troll in the bathrooms in Harry Potter at one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. like a mimic toilet. It, it was yeah, in. Understand. It was in the bathrooms. It was in the. They had it in the dungeons, and then it was in the bathrooms. Trolls up all over the place. Look, like, I even remember like this uh, one specific uh, horror movie. I don't even know the name of it when I was a kid. And like, uh, it has me forever. Uh, like, If I go into a bathroom and there's a curtain drawn, I have to pull the curtain every time. Make sure there's, there's some motherfucker back there. Because like, some kind of like weird hag, uh, undead thing from that oh, movie like was hiding in the something. bathroom. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't even remember what it was. I'd know it if I saw it, but like, dude, last time I, I let players uh, have some, uh, have a bathroom in D and D they looted the toilet paper. They looted the hand towels. They took the toilet brush. Someone wanted to take a nap in the bathtub. Damn. Wait, what kind of public bathroom has a bathtub? <laughs> well, this was a dungeon, you know, you got to have all the amenities. You, tub you think uh, the, well, you know, monsters need to, you know, take care of themselves, too. You get get that one player looking for drugs in the medicine cabinet. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> we don't need to get into, you know, race specific bathrooms or anything like that. We can just go ahead and move forward. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what how different are the racial needs in D&D for bathrooms outside of uh, maybe a booster seat for the halflings? Look, at we talk a lot about creatures and races here. Everybody knows the differences. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Do you think Zoras would need a separate bathroom? <laughs> oh, man. Ah, damn. <laughs> I guess with that. I don't know. Uh, how do snake people take a shit? You, if you don't know about snake anatomy, then you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's a reason we omit bathroom moments in Dungeons and Dragons, and it's just for simplicity's sake. Yeah, yeah. Same thing why uh, people skip sex scenes. <laughs> yeah, just I, fade to black. I, I don't know. I, I think there's a very big difference between like uh, fade to black sex scenes and like when you're when you have a the paladin goes to take a shit. He's not keeping all of his armor on. Like it, he's a completely vulnerable to toilet yeah. goblins. I need you to to role play the. What is it called? The donning or you're doffing your armor? Yeah, donning and doffing <laughs> armor. Five minutes doffing your armor. <laughs> okay, so you need to go really badly, but it takes five minutes to take it all off. <laughs> Kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, God. You just, oh, no. You just got to take off the lower parts. <laughs> you got 17 <laughs> buckles and straps. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they have like a little trap door. Jesus Christ. Oh, they oh yeah. you know, like those old pajamas. Oh, yeah. Leave that up to the artificer. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a great dude. Start. If your armor doesn't have the ability to like just to have a butt <laughs> flap. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. Every well, what you doing? Rest, I need you to, uh, to role play this for me. How are you taking the shit, man? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think there's a little bit of fun to be had with like a the player that's like, "Hey, listen!" Uh, uh, rushes right into the establishment. Where is the bathroom? Like, please, <laughs> magic sparking. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. In. They're like, oh, yeah, bathroom only for paying customers only. <laughs> Just throws an entire coin purse. Oh my god. Let's go ahead. Uh, Lester talked about effects of being a wild magic sorcerer. (laughs) (laughs) I love the idea that you could like, uh, it's like, oh, how are we going to break into this place? 
I have an idea. Bard bursts through uh, the doors. Where's the bathroom? I gotta go now. It's like, uh, excuse me, who the fuck are you? Why are you in here? You you don't understand. I will shit on your floor right now <laughs> if I don't find a bathroom. Uh, uh, down the hall to the left. And meanwhile, like, uh, gets in there, er- dumps everyone out of the bag of holding. We're in. It's like Mission Impossible. Oh my god. I always love this scene. That's brilliant. Shows where it's like someone like rushes into the room, slams the door. You hear like the random sounds and there's like a suddenly a, an air horn for some reason. <laughs> there's like random quacking. Like it's, it's crazy in there. There's like an explosion. Mm. Somebody screams. It's crazy. You know? <laughs> it sounds Why? like you finally got a soundboard going. I did. I found one. <laughs> I, I'm so proud. <laughs> Let's go ahead and start the show. <laughs> Wait. What? Why didn't it do? Excuse me, soundboard. I Oh, I, be, I didn't do the... Th- yeah, yeah, that's on me. <laughs> that's on me. <laughs> And welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you monsters, news, and bathrooms. I am your host, Orion. And I am your host, Sam. Welcome back. Welcome back. (laughs) It's been a wild time. Uh, I had to reset my computer this week, so key bindings, gone. Uh, OBS plugins, out the window. So we're flying by the seat of our pants here tonight. Yeah, oh yeah, we're all dogging reality out here, man. But, you know, that's all right, because we have with us a special guest this week. Uh, Why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, sure, I was waiting. (laughs) I was kind of waiting. Um, Hi, I'm the Goose Quill. I publish Homebrew on the Unearthed Arcana and D&D Homebrew subreddits, uh, all for free, uh, as part of my graduation project. Nice. Yeah. Graduation project, you say? Yes, I study game design. Whoa! So what a this is kind of my me combining Ooh. my game design skills and my love for Dungeons and Dragons into you know something that I really like doing, awesome. uh, and I'm basically using it to graduate. Hell yeah, man! Nice. Yeah. So um, I'm currently in the process of writing a book. Um, some of the stuff that I publish is included in the book, um, but that would basically be my graduation project. I plan on publishing it for free when it's done. Ooh, Uh, I I like the sound of that. Always good to bring uh, content out there to people, you know? Yeah, especially for free. (laughs) Yeah, we would love to have you back on for a free shit segment to talk about your book. Sure thing. (laughs) I'm all for it. We do love free shit. (laughs) Very much at you, Watsy. <laughs> yeah, Watsy. Okay. Oh man, hope you guys are having a good October so far. Yeah, Loving it, it's the, been an October. I mean, autumn has hit hard over here. Really? Yeah. It, yes, I am. Uh, at one point, it was twenty-one degrees Celsius. So I don't know the exact temperature in Fahrenheit for you guys, but I think that's like a uh, like a thirty-three degree difference, plus or minus like some other factor, something like but... that. Basically, think summer temperatures, right? And then out of the blue, one day it's boom, fall as it, and it it's just kept at that temperature. Interesting. That's wild. I mean, like, I was looking at the forecast for this coming week, and apparently there's going to be some snow here in the U.S. Oh, I'm so jealous. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, not in our area. Like, just, like, Midwest. uh, up. Midwest? uh, Yeah, like, the northern Midwest. Interesting. It's weird to me, because, like, uh, up here in Maine, I'm always, like, right next to Canada, all snuggled up and cold.
No, same here. I wish we did. Hmm. But it usually snows for like five days a year. Something like that, and that's about it. Interesting. Yeah, but we get the, the warm airflow, basically, from the Atlantic, so that's why we don't get a whole lot of snow. It needs to be really, really cold in order for it to snow in the Netherlands. Yeah, that makes sense, because like, uh, the Netherlands, like uh, they kind of catch the same uh, part of the jet stream that uh, uh, England does. Yeah, yeah, basically. So we have this, um, uh, what's it called? We have something called the Elfstedentocht, which is basically ice skating through 11 different cities in the northern side of the Netherlands. Um, and every year it's the same discussion. Is it going to happen? And everybody knows the answer. It's not going to happen. But it's a recurring <laughs> thing every year. And everybody knows climate, uh, global warming has happened. Like It's not going to happen anymore, but just the idea of it possibly happening is what keeps people going and keeps people up at night. You know, you got to give people a little bit of hope, but that's a double-edged sword because when there's a, like hope without anything actually going on, it's like, ah, fuck, you yes. made me hope again. Exactly. And it's only a matter of time before the discussion pops up again. I'm giving it maybe a month. Yeah, fair enough. I think uh, my biggest position, uh, it's an unpopular one with global warming, but I'm all for it for the sheer fact that I got to know what's under Antarctica's ice. I got to know. <laughs> you you know what's under the ice? Uh, million year old viruses. I was that, about to that, say. I'm not that, sure that, if we DNA want to strands. encounter those. We don't want this. <laughs> you don't want this. Please. I need. I need a new continent worth exploring. I need. Uh, uh, we need to get under like the the. Let's just pretend that there's an Antarctic dome. Let's yeah. pretend like all these movies were right. I think I might agree with you that they're a little bit above the line. Uh, I don't know how, how it's possible <laughs> to clear the Arctic, clear the Arctic Ocean. It's pretty well known that ice is melting in the Arctic Ocean. It's been classified compared to years ago as a biosphere. Super cool. Super cool. Uh, I heard about that, but I'm so glad you mentioned psychics because that leads me into this one little uh, t news tidbit for the week that oh. you're, you're going to love. Okay, okay, go ahead. Go off. Okay, uh, are, are both of you familiar with uh, Stranger Things, the the Netflix show that has revitalized D&D? &D? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it, <laughs> you you know exactly, Sam. So uh, one of the lead actresses of the show, uh, the, uh, the the girl that uh, plays Eleven, she's uh, uh, apparently a psychic came up to her and told her that she needs to become a feminist. Wait, what? <laughs> yes, a, a psychic okay. told her that she's a feminist. What? Okay. <laughs> about the show <laughs> no no th this is just complete i i i read about it this week and i'm just like <laughs> it, is, is that saying? where we're it, it like she she's going with it i mean uh if a spiritualist comes up to you and says hey sam you're actually a communist do you not start waving a red flag <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Yo, you're so right. Okay, it's right. Millie Bobby Brown had an. <laughs> i mean good for her on discovery i guess yeah more uh, power to her yeah I, mean, I i don't know it's like a, you know there's a discovering yourself and then someone's like man, you are this i had a vision yeah i feel like people <laughs> give they care way too much about <laughs> yeah i i would agree with that but damn if that didn't give me a chuckle <laughs> when i first heard it like come on like uh, don't get me wrong. I, I think that there are like psychic things out there, and that yeah, that's a legit correct. thing in in some sections. But there's also a lot of con artists out there, and somehow oh, yeah. I just don't think that someone who's got the gift is going to walk up to you and be like, "Hey, you <laughs> uh, you need to be a part of this ideology." 
it is in your life path to be this. And it's just like, oh, okay. Uh, no, I, I actually get that all the time. They they knock on my door. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't pay any credence to people that tell me that I need to be something else. Like, you're like, you're a vegan. <laughs> maybe they just rolled really high on their persuasion check <laughs> yeah i, I guess so. No, the real life yeah, shit yeah, does happen really high persuasion you know Fuck. it just makes me think like you're a vegan harry uh i'm a what you're you're a <laughs> vegan and a thumping of a good one if once you train up a little do, do i have to give up eggs yes no more eggs harry <laughs> are the chicken nuggies vegan <laughs> there are uh, damn. Look, I remember when I worked at that is a thing So wait, the, the nuggets are made of cauliflower? Yes. Does it? Does it taste remotely like chicken? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would imagine close. that most vegan things don't. Like, a, yeah. I think the best uh, vegan anything out there might be like a uh, soy or tofu, but that's just a uh, <laughs> probably. Yeah, fair enough, but like the texture isn't even remotely close. They use cauliflower to sub for a lot of things, like even in pasta. Yeah. It's weird. Do your thing. <laughs> well, as long as they're not trying to change my dietary habit. <laughs> yeah. But I, I want to hear more about this uh this project that, that you uh, were working on, like a oh, right. graduation, okay. like, dude, How that's a practical way. Oh, we got time. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So I've been running a campaign for, my, for a couple of players for about a year or one and a half, I think. So I started with it right before I started my graduation year. Um, and then graduation came around and I got the opportunity to, you know, explore what I really like doing, which is writing homebrew. So I thought, why not combine the two things? Start writing right. a book, right? I really, really wanted to write a book. Um, mm. So I decided to write a setting guide. So not a campaign guide. So it doesn't include an adventure, but it includes all the world building. It, it includes a class and subclasses for all the available class classes already present in D&D. Uh, feats, monsters, uh, backgrounds as well, playboard aces. Basically just a whole bunch of stuff that they could then use to, you know, flesh out their characters a little bit more and put the, uh, give them a little place in the game world. Interesting. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I do like that. So there's a bunch of stuff in that book that I haven't published yet that I do plan on doing. Mm -hmm. But every single time I publish something, uh, I get inspired to make other things, so I never get around yeah. to doing it. Uh, I definitely hear that. We had Amethyst Dragon on the show. Uh, he at the time he was uh, the man of like twelve hundred plus homebrews. Now it's fifteen hundred plus because he's making homebrews every day. Man, I wish I had that sort of time. <laughs> he's definitely got the spirit. Man. He, he yes. just gets. Well, you, they say lightning doesn't strike t twice, but inspiration. Uh, it it just strikes all the time, you know. He's got the magic, man, and that's, that's I feel like inspiration is so powerful. Like if you have it, you gotta roll with it. Mm, for sure. Just looking up some stuff. It looks good. Mm. I like it. I mean, like I'm writing homebrew every single day, but I publish stuff once every two weeks, I think, because I just you know I really like adding visuals um, mm. and making yeah. it look pretty, but that takes time. That's something that we're uh, trying to do with the homebrews that we put on the Patreon. Cause uh, we, we had an artist that uh, does a bunch of stuff for us, but once again, uh, like I mentioned uh, before the show, 
uh, with our editor. Like it, it, some of our people in the server just had been uh, had a lot of trouble. So you got, uh-huh. got to wait on a couple of uh, the people to get back in order. But that his situation sorted out, so we'll be back in business. You know. Mm. That that would be nice cuz uh mm-hmm. we do get a, a lot of uh, cool uh, ideas that I definitely want to kind of like get out there. Yeah. I mean, if we have any artists listening who uh want some some work, some commissions, you know. Absolutely. Just out of curiosity, what tool do you guys use to write homebrew? Uh, I use a, let's see, what was it again? Uh, it's like a, I, I forget what it was called, but like I have to write the stuff out in HTML. But is it the homebrewery? <laughs> it is the homebrewery. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, homebrewery. I uh, use that one I, as well, yeah. Yeah, I learned HTML years ago because on a whim. I was like, ah, I've got to teach myself how to code. So uh-huh. uh, HTML is a good entry level thing into that. And uh, then that, it's like, okay, years later, I don't use it much. So it, it's about the only purpose I have for that skill out of a little bit of work with our website. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, it's nice that you still get to use it then, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and like, uh, I don't remember all of it, but, you know, people talk a lot of shit about uh, the... Uh, AI stuff nowadays, but chat GPT comes in clutch with uh, helping out with coding because it's a uh, verse in basically every coding language out there. That's true. I think the, um, I, I think the software development landscape in general is going to see a massive switch in a couple of years. Yeah. Like a, it's one of those things where you learn the, the code first. Okay. Now y- don't do that child. <laughs> so like i was saying the uh it's it's one of those things where once you have the foundational knowledge there it it becomes a valuable tool because a lot of coding as you probably already know is copy paste adjust yes. and uh, chat gpt expedites that process because rather than having to go and painstakingly look for a piece of code that you might need you could have it just to uh, kind of assist with uh, getting the some of the tidbits that you need for the code that you're composing. Right. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way of saying it. Yeah, it's like, oh, I, I need this specific thing. Can't think of it off the top of my head. Hey, GPT, oh, oh what's this? Okay, uh, this little bit of code, you know what, that's useful. Not quite complete. I'll add X, Y, and Z, put it together, rearrange this, copy this, paste that. Good to go. Yeah. But I think the skill there is knowing exactly what you need to adjust, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's a valuable tool, but uh, it's useless if you don't know what you're doing in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Although it's a valuable teaching tool if you want to like mm-hmm. uh, get a little bit of a boost like oh I I can't I struggle with learning things. Okay, cool. Well, you can learn on your own and it's like okay, if you have a question but you don't have any uh anybody that you can actually ask, you could ask this and it's like okay, it'll give you a rudimentary answer without having to sift through a bunch of uh people online that some know their stuff and others don't. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. I think it just makes Googling a whole lot easier, <laughs> right? That's essentially what it is, you know? Yeah. It's a search engine that actively talks to you without like having to scroll for the answer. You just get the one you want straight away. Yeah. yeah. I remember back in the day when you'd have to go like a 20 pages deep just to find what you're looking for. It's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. When I started studying game design, uh, Googling was a really important skill to have, mm. especially when... 
coding basically because there would be a lot of problems that a lot of other people had already solved but good luck finding the exact same one basically right Mm -hmm. and being able to phrase it properly in order to get the right answer you want right yeah and like knowing how to ask a question is the really the biggest thing there and like falling back to typical D &D, like it really like uh, with working with a good dm it a great dm is fine and all but where are you without a player that knows how to ask the right questions exactly yeah i think that's a really good way of saying it yeah true Mm. because uh one of the things that i've seen like sam like he'll have a little bit of trouble with in our games is like we have a lot of passive players in the party so Mm -hmm. kind of inspiring uh these players to be more proactive and ask the questions it, it makes a big difference right. we've seen a big uh, a good amount of growth uh, throughout the campaign from the start mm-hmm. to finish absolutely and it also makes things much more interesting as a dm right because let's say mm-hmm. you have a, a certain puzzle that you want somebody to figure out but you don't want to lay it on the table straight away right oh absolutely right then the player needs to start asking questions about the environments and what they see and it becomes this little back and forth Exactly. Which is 10,000 times more interesting than just, okay, th- this is the stuff you can see. Good luck fixing it, right? So right. finding the solution. Yeah, like that's what made me fall in love with the hobby initially. Just the uh, the concept that the player can be like, is there a body of water nearby? Is mm-hmm. there a chandelier in the room? And meanwhile, you, the DM, is like, you know what? There wasn't before, but yeah. now that you mention it, like, I yes, thought about there, that. there, yes. there sure. is actually. Yeah. And I love that because it, you know, it helps me know like if my knowledge of like a scene, you know. Yeah, yeah. and it, at the same time, it's rewarding the players for being creative, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, actively absolutely. working I towards love something. creative solutions, like like even if that's not the the way that I had. Yeah, like I'm perfectly content to have my players outsmart me. It's perfectly fine. Absolutely. And I think as a DM, a lot of people get in that pride of like, I am right. My stuff is like this way. I set it up to be like this. And they create this very like rigid structure for themselves. Because it's like your players are going to outsmart you. They're going to like out clever you. They're going to like. They're have you guys you played bad. Baldur's Gate? <laughs> I have not played uh, Baldur's Gate, but I've seen the uh, videos that people are doing. The the thing with Baldur's Gate is that it kind of reflects that uh, that kind of behavior that also occurs in Dungeons and Dragons, where there are so many different things to uh, mm-hmm. or ways to solve a problem, mm-hmm. and somehow mm-hmm. the developers manage to think about all of them, right? I don't want to mm-hmm. spoil too much in case you're still planning to play it, but um, at one point, there's a, a potential enemy that's uh, guarding a really powerful explosive. Um, and you need to talk your way out of it. But what you can also do is send your rogue in to basically steal it from under their nose. Mm-hmm. And the game will play uh, a bit of dialogue for you. Uh, wow. <laughs> I think you know, like, hey, we thought of that. We knew you were going to do that. Right. And it's, it's in terms of like um, video game design, that's really impressive. Because yeah, generally, really video is. games are very linear, and that's why it's so difficult to make uh, Dungeons and Dragons into a video game. Yeah. Because really you is. never know what to expect from your players. Yeah, because the, the whole fun about D&D is like being able to really, like, literally whatever you come up with could be wrong. Like, <laughs> and how do you, you know, how do you put that into a game? Right. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. the, the concept of... Uh, like I said before, you you ask the dungeon master, "Hey, is this there, or what's going on with that?" Kind of a segues into you could get a yes, or there's the no, but right, and that's a very powerful thing right there. I do love the, a no, the but. no but, you know. Uh-huh. As a as a DM, having the power of like your players are at your fingertips, you're like, hmm. That was a really good idea. I like it. 
It'd be a shame if someone were to steal it. (laughs) You're almost there. (laughs) It's the uh, you can certainly try type of deal, right? Uh, honestly, like there have been situations as a DM where I'm like, I really don't want you to succeed on this role, yeah. but they get it anyway. And like a contextually, there's no reason in the situation for them to not succeed. It's like, right, right. You know I'll let you have it, but I'm not happy about it. <laughs> like when, when our character, one of our uh, party members stole that belt of cloud giants trick. <laughs> Ran with that for most of the campaign. I mean, sometimes as a DM, you just have to suck it up and have to let the players have that way. I was, <laughs> was just like, send it, man. <laughs> you guys earned it, I guess. <laughs> they had uh, some damn. elaborate plan to steal it and then like rolled amazing. I was just like, well. <laughs> uh, nothing will top the elaborateness that was the uh, traveling concubine <laughs> <laughs> situation. Get some every time. <laughs> <laughs> That poor man never saw it coming. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fight the cultists. Would find the leader. Uh, what? Who are you? Why are you in here? We're traveling concubines. Yay! <laughs> your your eldritch master has rewarded you, but he didn't know what you wanted, so he gave they sent the three of us. You know, that's three different races, all all the flavors. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm, then I'm pretty sure, like, I had all three of you roll persuasion. Two of you got, like, a nat 20. <laughs> I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this man it, is it, cold. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he's not even listening. <laughs> the funny part about that is, like, I had zero to any of my uh, charisma uh, persuasion stuff. So it's just, like, it was just pure luck that any of that was working. Was so great. But I think that's a pretty good segment into the rest of the news that we have for this week, right? Well, let me uh, see right here, because I have to actually go out of my way with our little things. Oh, oh man. <laughs> yeah, news stuff, Sam. Breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> I Da-da-da. love that singer. <laughs> I, I really do. But this week in uh, tabletop news, Magic the Gathering kills both draft and set boosters to create a unified product, the play booster. So uh, we're back to where we started as far as card games go. But like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. They, they were selling set boosters and then draft boosters because like right, uh, right. they're. Because like the set is like, OK, uh, where you can get like good cards for your collection. Uh-huh. And the draft is like if you're joining a booster draft, which is uh, its own format entirely. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So, so they combine uh, them into one thing. Yeah, yeah. They're just make they're getting rid of both. It's just going to be a regular play booster. Uh, the draft boosters have uh, lower odds of getting better cards. Okay. And uh, Watsy was kind of under fire for. Uh, you know, that being kind of shitty and then yeah. selling their uh, set boosters at a higher markup. Yeah, it's kind of a dick. Man. Uh, I'm telling you, man, that, they just got to <laughs> keep dr- dropping the ball. We know. will buy this company out. Are they yet. trying to like ostracize all of their resources? Like what's going on? Well, th- this is a step in the right direction, but damn, they had to spend so long just like, okay, we got all these different kinds of boosters. I mean, I'm not a and magic you- head, so I don't know, but you yeah. know, but this sounds kind of like it'll piss people off because because then won't people <laughs> they've been have to buy the, the draft play booster stuff do for draft. years now yeah yeah people like, like you know that kind of stuff. they're gonna hate the change or whatever well as long as the play uh boosters are good for booster drafts i don't think yeah, it'll be a problem that's true. like but i mean increase like, your odds you of getting good cards be? right i mean will it is, is that what they said i well, theoretically, because uh, the odds are going to be the, the same no matter what booster, because it's only going to be one kind of booster. But wouldn't that also... Because, I mean, how many cards are going to be in this combined booster now, you know? That's a very good question. Uh, honestly, they could, 
Mm. It, it, it says it's going to contain uh, 15. How many were in the draft in the other ones before? Uh, I think the draft booster was about the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think but, it kind of depends yeah. on that a little bit too. Because then it kind of fucks with like the ratio, you know? Right, right. You're adding a wider, then, wider variety of cards to the same amount of card pack, you know? All I can say is like the, the more WotC does stuff, but uh, the, the more their stock price drives down, we guys, we can seriously <laughs> yeah, get I the mean- community together. <laughs> we can buy th- this from a Hasbro. If everybody puts in a dollar after their stock price drops to a dollar, <laughs> we could take back our game. To use um, the means of production. Exactly. <laughs> like a, uh, Shit, maybe that psychic was right. Maybe I am a commie. <laughs> Calming and the only thing that counts, D and D. Stock price is fifty six dollars. Is down. Uh, Oh, it dropped two dollars since last week. That's great. Yeah, yeah. But (laughs) honestly, like when it comes to seizing the means of production, (laughs) uh, I really do feel like this is the one exception for me because D and D is made by the community. It is the fans. Like it's like Watsi and Hasbro. They are not D and D. We are D and D. Yeah, man. Goose is D and D. You know, he he's out there making his own stuff. You know, exactly. I get where you're coming from. Yeah, right. I think um, at the end of the day, all you can really do as uh, being Wizards of the Coast and being Hasbro, right, is publishing books and publishing setting guides and stuff like that. Yeah, but mm. you cannot make the adventures you cannot make the experience of dungeons and dragons uh, uh, something that you can sell right right because that needs to be a person dedicating their time to sit at the table with friends hosting a campaign exactly Um, same way that for example uh any other board game you, you can really only sell the physical product but you cannot sell the experience right this is kind of what i love about like people versus companies right and corporations it's like this is kind of proving that like they just want the money and like they're trying to profit off of like people's enjoyment of like you know like a property that they don't even really create like we kind of do everything (laughs) so like what are they even like doing I, I mean, I don't have any problem with them trying to no, no, profit no. off of it. I just wish that they, you know, it's, it's focus a little bit more on the... At the end of the day, a book is really all... It's a toolkit, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a set of tools, basically, that you give to somebody in order to, for them to organize a game. Um, yeah. And I just wish that from time to time, they put a little bit more effort into those tools. Yeah. Honestly, like I've seen better stuff come off the DMs guild than what they've been putting out lately. And Wizards of the Coast, uh, on the whole, they've been spending more time uh, coming up with ways that they can make things more uh, sensitized and uh, more appealing to their audiences in the terms of like, say, uh, oh, we got to remove the term witch or shaman or druid. Yeah. Really? Yeah, seriously. Like uh, in Magic the Gathering, they were removing uh, removing the term uh, witch, draman, uh, druid, and uh, other things. And how long before that bleeds into uh, some of the stuff that we're seeing in typical D&D production? Like they they felt the need to like uh, completely revise the Haddo Z uh, early on this year. Yeah, there's you know, there's been a lot of things we talked about uh, on this you know, podcast before about, you know, the race changes and them wanting to, you know, remove races and stuff like that. It's been, I mean, it's been weird. I get that maybe the, the term race is a little bit uh, the wrong term if you look at what is actually available as playable races, right? Perhaps. Um, I have no problem with them renaming it a species. Um, yeah. But I think, yeah, some of the some of the other stuff that they are doing or are attempting to do is maybe a little bit overkill. Right, right. It's a little, it's a little bit like out of touch. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
exactly. But then again, I think that um, you don't necessarily need Wizards of the Coast to play Dungeons yeah. & Dragons, right? Absolutely. If you just look at any of the Kickstarters, that millions of dollars in funding. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think the content in those books is, uh, f- from time to time, a uh, hundred times better than uh, some of the latest books made by Wizards of the Coast. And that's think- not me trying to flame Wizards of the Coast. It is just showing how much passion those people have for yeah. the whole and the and amount I, of passion that they put what, into it. What I feel like it hurts me is like you can see, you know, the passion that people have for D D, right? But then you look at like Wizards of the Coast and you see this like this like unfeeling machine, you know, of an entity that's like you know, pay up. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think the thing is, Coast... like, uh, every time I've worked someplace and corporate comes down and they got a whole bunch of new rules for how you're going to run the show here. Meanwhile, new, corporate's new rules have nothing to do with making anything actually work better at the grunt level of things because yeah. corporate is disconnected. They don't care. Please. They don't know. They're not actually working with any of this stuff. Neither. All they know is they have to sit around in a boardroom pretending to be useful. <laughs> Meanwhile, the only uh, the only people that actually make shit run are out there doing the hard work. And in our case, yeah. the people yeah. doing the hard work and making things happen are the people that actually play D and D. Like, I think if you're going to be on the board of directors for WotC, you need uh, a few requirements. You need to have your magic deck locked and ready, <laughs> holstered up anytime you walk into the office, and you will be constantly under right. threat of somebody uh, challenging you to a game. Like and if you Yu-Gi-Oh lose, you world. get audited. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I feel like every time you lose, you should be audited. Oh, I think man. the problem of uh, <laughs> higher up coming down onto like the actual people putting in the work, right, is not. It, it's a pretty global problem. I think it happens everywhere. Yeah, but yeah. I think in, in the case of Wizards of the Coast, I think there's uh, game designers that are very passionate yeah. about mm. you know the product that they're putting out there. Absolutely. Um, but I think that they are being held back by stakeholders. Yeah, they really are. Like. Bare minimum, all, all these stakeholders, all these uh, board uh, of directors people, they need to, like, for, we already talked, step one, they all have to start carrying a deck. They have to be, you know, they got to be packing. Uh, they got to have the, the dual step disc two, ready. <laughs> they have to be involved in at least one weekly or bi-weekly game. Yeah. And if they're in a bi-weekly game, they need at least two one-shots a year in addition to that. Because, look, we all know the people on this board are, like, 50-year-old men who played D&D when they were in their 20s. Like, <laughs> Part of the uh, interview or job interview could be what is yeah. the weakest and strongest subclass currently in Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> you got a 1v1 me in a magic game. <laughs> if you win, you're hired. <laughs> Damn, you lose work. straight to the shadow realm. You're <laughs> out of here. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Like, a, there's such a disconnect with the people that run the show. Like, if you're going to be in charge of running m- the my hobby, my games, you need to bare minimum be involved in my hobby and my games. You know? Yeah. Where's the yeah, love? I can see. Yeah. Where's the yeah. love for your game? <laughs> Well, speaking of love for their game, uh, th- we do know that there are some amazing people working there, and some of those oh, people yeah. had a hand in putting together Planescape, which was just released. Hell yeah, that's what so, we're talking about. Let's Adventures go. in the Multiverse. Which Woo. looks super cool. Well, let's see. Cool. Uh, right now, it is 2023. Uh, 5e started in 2014. What took so long? God dang. <laughs> Holy shit. We're old, boys. We're old. I'm just saying, like, why? it? There's This should have been, like, maybe the seventh book to come out as soon as they were le- releasing books. <laughs> Look, explain for some people who may not know what Planescape is. Me included. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Planescape is... a. Uh, 
basically the entire multiverse of settings. You got the the elemental plane of fire, water. You got the shadow fell, the Feywild, the the outer planes, uh, the the planes of. Uh, I think even Asgard's a plane uh, mm-hmm. actually. Mechanis uh-huh. and yep. like you hear about all these different planes throughout D and D, but you got little to nothing to work with in fifth edition. So yeah, if you want to use anything things. to do with that, yeah, we have. And if you want to use anything reasonable for these uh, planes in uh, modern fifth edition, you got to go and steal from fourth. You got to steal from third edition. You got to take from older editions just to be able to do this. And that can be a pain in the ass, you know, especially if you're one of those stick in the mud. I only do it by the book DMs. I mean, look, this is a lot of uh, what I talk about, you know, in those cosmology episodes. There's not a lot of substance, you know, when it comes to like the realms and stuff for the dish. Mm. Let's see what's included in this. I mean, like they broke it up into three books, just the same as they did with the. Uh, with uh, some of the other recent things that they did. Yeah. So let's see, two new backgrounds, uh, seven uh, additional feats, 12 uh, ascendant factions, um, 50 additional creature stat blocks, which includes planner uh, incarnates, hierarch modrons, and time dragons, and an encounter builder. Okay, time dragons. Now, that's wild. Oh, yeah. I am down for some time dragons. Chrono dragons? That sounds pretty sick. That's yeah, cool. it, it, it does. So they got some adventure hooks, encounter tables, maps of the Outlands, and more. Yeah, they got like a whole bunch of uh, shit in here. So if anyone's interested, uh, they can probably check that out on their website. Although that kind of leads me into the next thing, Sam. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, remember when we were talking about Pe- uh, Penguin, Wan- or, uh, Penguin Random House uh, being yes, yes. Uh, dropped as a publisher? Yeah, WotC has decided to seize the means of publication and just make their own books. Cut out the middleman. Okay. Um, uh, I see. I, I don't see it as that big a deal, but a lot of people are worried that they might increase their prices because that's one less uh, entity negotiating as a middleman. I could see that. I mean, as far as that goes, just kind of have to I don't know. see what happens, I guess. Uh, I am definitely in the wait and see boat on that one yeah. with you because I think that they might find ways to cut corners and save money that way. Mm-hmm. So maybe depends right. on how robust their ability to produce is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it also depends on like how much that actually changes, I guess, you know, like. Ow. Mm. If anything, a, it should be cheaper than to make books, yeah. right? Yeah. I would because imagine. If you're cutting out the middleman and you just print them yourself, you're saving them cost. Right. Yeah, I mean, so, at most you have to hire like a, some people to negotiate. But at the same time, those people that you were hiring to negotiate were probably the same people you had uh, negotiating with your middleman. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. All right. So, so, I... If the books get more expensive, I'd be really surprised. Oh, I, I think they already the, are pretty expensive to be honest. They, they are. Like, yeah. if the books get more expensive, I think that would be the last nail in the coffin. It would be kind of like a because middle finger to the, the, the consumers, huh? Uh, your average D and D player uh, has had enough of this, and not nearly as fed up as your average DM that actually pays for this shit. Yeah. Speaking of paying for shit, uh, mm. moving on to our last little bit of news, yes, Pathfinder yes. and Starfinder uh, this coming year are going to be raising their prices because, like everybody else, they are not immune to inflation. Rest in peace. I mean, <laughs> honestly, good for them. I mean, how much? As like, long as uh, you know, the, they're, yeah, if it's a reasonable price, then good uh, for them. Let's, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, it says uh, in this article, like the bounties and quests uh, thing that they had, which, which was previously four ninety nine, will be five ninety nine. Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay, and uh, like 
just kind of skimming through some of this. Uh, so they're they're trying their best to kind of flatten the disparity amongst their uh, price increases. Hmm. And add more stuff that's going to be uh, on the $20 uh, list of uh, things that you can get there. Okay. So I, I think I think Paizo generally knows what they're doing in terms of uh, how they've been handling things this year. Mm-hmm. And a, a mild price increase considering how everything's gone economically. I'm not surprised. Yeah. And I don't think uh, too many people are going to be really concerned or hit hard by this. No, I don't think so either. I think, like you said, people might be, you know, happy to see this. You know, good for them. Like you said. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Uh, I mean, last year has been definitely good for Paizo. Yeah, given yeah. everything that happened with Wizards of the Coast. Oh man. Yeah, they're definitely uh, picking up a uh, extra from uh, what Wizards has dropped. So I'd say they're probably going to be perfectly fine. Yeah, I think so as well. Yeah. And I mean, if anything, if they raise their prices a little bit, uh, you know, it will give them a larger profit margin, which in turn, you know, I think they kind of deserve that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. uh, I think they've earned the profit margin that they're at, but like uh, most profit margins uh, across the industry aren't re- objectively that high. Oh, no, not at all. I I'd- I don't necessarily know what the profit margins are for Paizo and Watsi, mm. but like seeing as a Hasbro is maintained uh, in like 70% uh, so by Watsi, then it's like, okay, it, yeah. it, it's got to be significant. I think you'll find that um, most of the profit from Wizards of the Coast is actually made through the Indie Beyond. Just Mm -hmm. from its subscriptions and the digital copies of the books. Right. Because the moment that you do not need to actively print them, you know, that saves you a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, when you're removing that element of production, like, say it costs you like uh, 20 bucks to print a book and then, like, uh, you know, even more to have someone revise the book, make sure it printed fine. And and then distribution and shipping. And yeah. then uh, markups that are uh, applied when uh, selling through distributors. That's that's a whole lot. And when you're able to remove that entirely, it's no different than when video games started uh, doing uh, e-commerce and selling their games for about the same as what they were selling previously. It's like, okay, you can buy Mario, uh, the physical copy, or you can buy Mario, the digital copy, same price. The difference right. is like, the sixty dollars is sixty dollars, and that sixty dollars on the e copy is straight into Nintendo's pocket. Yeah, facts, facts. But also, I do much prefer to buy stuff uh, the physical way, basically, right? Mm-hmm. Having the physical books. Mm-hmm. Honestly, you can't replace the uh, inspiration that comes where with when you're at the table with a bunch of your friends, you're playing the game, and like maybe you look to a player, hey, open up a to the page that we need for that specific thing just to do that real quick for me i don't remember the rule Mm -hmm. and then they open it they grab the book and just they don't even look they just open it up and it opens magically to the page that you're looking for yeah what really like makes me feel good as a dm is when like my players are like taking notes and stuff and they're like oh man like flipping through their notes and they're like oh i remember (laughs) this and they're like and like you yeah or if you if you give a description of a monster and they start yeah. rushing through the monster manual, like shit, 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 where is it? I love that. Oh, that book won't help you here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a homebrew monster of my own making. This I is a monster of my own before. creation. <laughs> Your character. Speaking of which, no Sam, that I think that segues into yeah. our monster of the week, maybe? I yes, no? Does. I think it does, yeah. So, to keep with the spirit of halloween spooktober the crazy time of the demons and monsters i'm going to talk about one of the most famous you know kind of conceptual ideas of a monster the frankenstein right the flesh golem all right all right yeah yeah was it uh, Mary <laughs> i just Shelley? realized i just yeah, realized Mary how smooth Shelley's that segue is oh thanks mm, i right. love it 
<laughs> attempt was made. <laughs> oh, Sam, we got to make you a stinger for your segment. You know, just like boom. Yes, you're so whimsical. <laughs> so, Flash Golem. Now that you got a soundboard, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just that was just a Discord one. <laughs> Flash golems were put together from the body parts of several different creatures, usually humans, all stitched and bolted into a new and gruesome humanoid form. Bigger than a living man, they were usually 8 feet, 2.4 meters tall, about 500 pounds, 230 kilograms in weight. As the flesh was often robbed from graves and still decaying, it had a lingering slight smell of dead flesh and fresh turned soil. No, normally, no ordinary animal would willingly follow its trail. Unable to fully control its body, a flesh golem moved and walked stiffly. It was unable to speak, being only able to make a hoarse roar. Its clothing and possessions were whatever its creator wished to give it, often just a tattered pair of trousers and no weapons. So, yeah, you were definitely right. The uh, the Mary Shelley Frankenstein, uh, or the modern Prometheus, was an 1818 novel. Uh, Frankenstein tells the story of Victor Frankenstein, a young scientist who creates a sapient creature, an unorthodox scientific experiment. So yeah, we all we all know what Frankenstein is. You know, it's a bunch of body parts put together. Big green man struck mm, by lightning. Lives. Yeah, he lives. You know, I, I saw a little bit of young Frankenstein the other week, and uh, just. Dude, I've never actually sat down and watched the movie, but uh, I'm sold. We got to add it to the watch party list for this month for the server. It'd be great. I mean, we haven't done a watch party in a while. We should. I miss it. Yeah, Forrest has been uh, away doing his own stuff, but, yeah. you know, he's settled down. I He's basically back. So we'll see yeah. where we can go from there. I think it, it's always funny to me because like people are like, oh, you know, Frankenstein's monster and then it's Victor Frankenstein. But the monster is not Frankenstein, right? It's like the mm. monster was created by Frankenstein. It never really has a name, you know, but the name. Well, yeah. You know, the name of what yeah. Frankenstein would be would be a flesh gold. You know. Mm. Yeah, like that. that was the byproduct the creation there you know check this out so this is really interesting um i found out that there is a flatwoods monster uh nestled within the rugged landscape of west virginia's braxton county seven eyewitnesses and a scared dog had an otherworldly encounter that still can't be explained today <laughs> The story goes that in 1952, a group of children playing football saw a bright object streak across the sky before crashing close to a nearby farm. After calling for one of their mothers and being joined by several other children, the group headed toward the object to see what had fallen. What they saw changed their lives forever. <laughs> they all described <laughs> a Frankenstein-like monster. All seven witnesses reported it was 10 to 12 feet tall with a green face, red body, and claws instead of hands. Its eyes glowed as it floated toward them, emitting a sickening metallic order as it grew closer. When others returned <laughs> to the site to investigate later, only a foul odor and only two large skid marks retained, remained. So... This is an orbital drop, essentially. Yeah. Like some I alien know. dude just like kind of dropped from <laughs> orbit, left really some skid you. marks, floated around menacingly, and hopped off. <laughs> I don't know what the hell. Like I couldn't find anything else, but like Frankenstein like monster sounds interesting, I guess. That Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. What more can you say? Um, that, was, uh, that was pretty cool. So in the Forgotten Realms, right, the, the nature of a flesh golem could be really anything that the creator, you know, kind of had the ability to make it. You know, the quality, yeah, like, yeah. And, you know, stuff like that. But there were a few interesting variants that I found. So one is a fiendish flesh golem. It was a CR8 flesh golem that was formed from various fiends, namely devils, yugoloth, and demons. They were particularly large constructs, each of which was unique in its own design. The secret to creating fiendish flesh golems was known only to night hags, and they rarely shared this esoteric knowledge with others. Ah, so night hags are the real Frankenstein here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it definitely makes sense that they would, you know, create these kind of 
fiend flesh cones. And uh, the picture that I found for them is really kind of fucky. Like, for example, this creature has like, like, like werewolf feet with the three claws and like the the, the <laughs> disjointed like leg, you know, with the bent out like satyr knees. <laughs> and then it has Gnarly. like, like fucking <laughs> yugaloth mm-hmm. like arms. It's very so it's so weird. And then there were also well, the yeah. serpent flesh golems. With flesh golems, the sky's the limit, really. Yeah, I mean, you can really, you know, mm-hmm. creativity and magical and, you know, medical ability is like... I have a little bit here yeah. about how they're created and you know, what the process is like, but... Mm. No, there were also serpent flesh golems. Uh, were CR8 flesh golems that were created with the body of scaled kin, such as dragon kin, lizard folk, wanti, kobolds, etc. Um usually had abilities more turned towards like magical resistances and you know venom and poison and stuff like that um give this thing a scorpion tail and a big old meaty crab claw you know big meaty claws (laughs) yeah big meaty claws so getting into the creation of flesh golems here special unguent and bindings were needed to keep the flesh bound together during creation these alone would cost upwards of 500 gold pieces. Actually putting the body together required skills in medicine, surgery, or leatherworking. The spells animate dead, <laughs> bull strength, geese, quest, and limited wish by a capable spellcaster were used in creation of a flesh golem. The total monetary cost of its construction was around 10,500 gold pieces, and a complete flesh golem was valued at around 20,000 gold pieces, depending on you know specifics. So a level 17 party could effectively make their unholy, grotesque flesh golem army yeah. as long as someone knows how to work in either medicine or leather workers tools. Yeah. If you have somebody who is uh, proficient in like necromancy, you know, animate dead, you know, revitalizing flesh and stuff like that. Put some money into it, some, you know, materials. You could probably get it done. That would be the gnarliest life cleric ever. Oh, man. <laughs> If I, only I our love druid it. lived with all their body pieces that she's collected over the campaign. She could have made a. Oh, uh, she has been collecting <laughs> big time. <laughs> oh man! So like walking away from it at each fight, like I got a leg. <laughs> <laughs> can I? Yeah. Uh, can I? Can I cut the head off? <laughs> you could try. <laughs> You'd be terrified like, as the DM. Like, what do you want to uh, do? That? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> what's going on? You got some plans, huh? <laughs> Every time, uh, tactically, we have to be like, okay, everybody in the Dimension Diamond. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about all the corpse pieces in here. <laughs> There's a bunch of heads and legs and shit. Like, it's starting to smell. wings. Like. <laughs> so getting into the abilities and stats here. A flesh golem, like other similar constructs, was immune to any spell that could uh, alter its form. Other magical effects affected them differently. Uh, akin to living creatures. Magical fire and cold not only damaged flesh gold, but also slowed them down from a dozen seconds to hmm. over a minute. You know? So they had the uh, the weakness to fire and cold, usually. Magical electrical discharges actually healed the damaged flesh golem and undid Ooh. any slowing effect. Like a shambling mound. Exactly. Yeah. And if they were not damaged, it would actually become more durable temporarily. Their toughness means they require Ooh. adamantine weapons to effectively damage them in most cases. So I like that. You don't <laughs> see adamantine uh, nearly enough in most campaigns. No, absolutely not. I'm getting into their stats here, they have a strength of 19, dexterity of 9, constitution of 18, intelligence of 6, wisdom of 10, and charisma of 5. So you know, keep in mind, this can definitely vary depending on the body parts and creatures used and you know stuff like that um you have the berserk ability whenever the golem starts its turn with 40 hit points or fewer roll a d6 on a six the golem goes berserk on each of its turns while berserk the golem attacks the nearest creature it can see no creature is near enough to make or to move to and attack the golem attacks an object with preference for an object smaller than itself. Once the golem goes berserk, it continues to do so until it is destroyed or gains all its hit points. 
The golem's creator, if within 60 feet of the berserk golem, can try to calm it by speaking firmly and persuasively. The golem must be able to hear his creator, who must take an action to make a DC 15 charisma persuasion check. If the check succeeds, the golem ceases going berserk. Uh, if it takes damage while still at 40 points or fewer, the golem might go berserk again. <laughs> Okay, you know, kind of soothe the, the savage beast a little bit there. Right, right. Calm, calm, it's okay. <laughs> Just give I him really a hug. Did not held back with the Frankenstein inspiration here. Yeah, and mm. then now more Frankenstein inspiration, we have the aversion to fire. The golem takes fire damage, it has disadvantage on attack rolls, and makes ability checks until the end of his next turn. Oh, sorry, disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks until the end of his next turn. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we have the immutable form. The golem is immune to any spell or effect that would alter its form, you know, like I said. Last but not least, we have lightning absorption. Whenever the golem is subjected to lightning damage, it takes no damage and instead regains a number of hit points equal to the lightning damage dealt. Hmm. So, pretty strong thing. You know, this is a, this is a force. You got a wizard I, I like you, these bad boys. Oof. I yeah. kind of want to use them in the upcoming campaign now, so keep your eye out, yeah. Sam. <laughs> oh, man. Now I'm thinking about, you know, there's no reason they couldn't wield good weapons and good armor and stuff. You know, a good yeah. creator would take care of their child, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, deck see, them out, put that. some armor on there. Yeah. Uh, honestly, if you had like a whole bunch of flesh golems, you could get a good firing line. Oh, yeah. Who needs a, a you know, pallet and you can make your own? <laughs> literal meat shield oh man literal uh, meat yeah, shield. They, yeah yeah you got your your meat shield golems and then you have your airstrike golems <laughs> yeah who says you couldn't make a serpentine golems with wings you know shit <laughs> <laughs> well uh, actually sam snakes aren't manly n- enough to fly so ah uh, unfortunately yeah that's gotta be the best anime quote i've ever heard <laughs> but i mean there's not too much about flesh golems to really talk about so i mean that's really all i have but uh i think there's a lot that you can do with them this is you know to kind of keep the theme of today's episode the creativity is your limit dm can I'm really throw creativity. something crazy at you with you know just the idea of it being a flesh goal what i think would be extremely fun is to remove the immutable form yeah so the moment that <laughs> Somebody casts polymorph on it. All the individual body parts that it consists of actually morph into the body Ooh, parts of that animal. Yeah, <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah, turn it into a, a grotesque chicken. It. Yes, oh. or maybe just one singular body part changes. Yeah. Ooh, I like that more. Actually, that's like far more humoring you, uh... because it's composed of all this different DNA. Yeah, we have yeah, exactly. like a flesh golem that like fuses with like a, an ooze of some kind, you know. Now you got a now you got a symbiote. <laughs> I I really like that. Now, oh, Sam, yeah. Uh, yeah. we've talked about the IRL fight score uh, before, mm-hmm. and uh, we're not always able to do that because some of these uh, monsters are just like no fucking way. Right. But right. I think a flesh golem is definitely in, in the realm. Like, a, yeah. what would you rate that one? Man, I think if we're talking like a like a base, like regular, like Frankenstein, you know, Frankenstein's monster kind of flesh golem, they're kind of slow. They're very shambly. Yeah, they're strong, but like, you know, they're they're dead bodies for the most part. I give I give it like a six. All right, I think I'll go with a five. Yeah, you know, yeah, give myself a 50 50 shot. I mean, like, th- there's enough weaknesses there that, yeah. you know, I-, I could pull out all reliable. Like, I-, I always carry a lighter with me. You right, know? That's right. a good start. You know, a version <laughs> yeah, of fire. I-, I can light things on fire. Like, I, I will light the shirt <gasps> off my back and start whipping this thing. Like, <laughs> it'll be like, <laughs> And, and then, then I have to trick it into falling into something and impaling it <laughs> somehow. So, like, you know, all of a sudden we have to get into like a, the, the the weird tactics that come with fucking with something I, that. I feel big. like my plan would be like, I pull out like a knife or something. I like start, you know, I'm squaring it up, looking at where all the stitchings are on its body, going straight for the knee. <laughs> you just cut the stitches, not yeah. even the monster, just the stitches. No, 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 get the stitches, man cut the knees and it's like it's going down (laughs) (laughs) 
How about Just you guys? The we... elbows. <laughs> mm, I'm thinking, but fire aversion is really, really bad. Yeah. So mm. yeah, you'd probably Pull out take a fire it. knife. <laughs> a, a five out of five. Uh, five score of five. I think. Yeah. Fire blade. <laughs> yeah, five out of ten. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that's fair. I mean, I think uh, if you like culturally, we have enough of an awareness of what a Frankenstein type monster is. Yeah. So I think a lot of people would fall into the five category because it's like almost a generic uh, monster zombie. film. Yeah, at that it's point. like uh, generic zombie with scaled up. Just yeah. maybe a little bit too clunky to really yeah. be much of a threat, right? right? You can just always outrun it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And a lighter that's, and a bottle of deodorant do, will do wonders. That's always been my thing with like zombies. Like they're not the like, really that threatening, right? Like it's always the question: is it uh, is it the Walking Dead zombies or is it yeah, uh, yeah. Right, the second uh, Game of spring. Thrones zombies? <laughs> but look, who there's nothing to say that like you couldn't make a flesh golem, you know, mm. that's made well enough to be trucking down you know oh, yeah. not at that not. point they're going to overpower you it's just like yeah. if they got uh -huh. that speed mm. <laughs> it would be got... fun to make a flesh golem uh that is purely made of the body parts of red dragonborn to Ooh. basically overcome the fire aversion oh Ooh. man and, and a creative caster that's, that's making these things might think of that Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Start That's mixing just, Dragonborn you know, colors, you know? Exactly. Like, honestly, at that point, you're just building smarter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Work harder, not smarter. Improving on the base design. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And at that point, it's very much an engineering thing. Okay. okay so we, we slaughter a bunch of red Dragonborn, uh, get some wings from a Wyvern, strap mm -hmm. those babies on there. Um, Give it a second head from a different color dragonborn. You know what? Fuck it. Three heads. Yeah, exactly. That's so, like a Suddenly you've got a draconic uh, abomination, you know? Boom. Crazy flesh golem for your party to fight. <laughs> let's make a Frankenstein Tiamat. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. We can Frankenstein the Tiamat. So like a, you know, like have the heads positioned in different parts. So like, mm -hmm. a, you know, like that's breath attacks from like different directions uh, -huh. uh you could have like okay we get like a some maybe some harpy feet or something so like when it swoops in <laughs> oh, boom man. it can like carry someone away uh like sam said with, like, earlier armor yeah it was kind of the deal with like drakes too you know they are kind of the idea of like a draconic flesh golem you know where they're not really like natural dragon you know kin they're kind of created through like magical like, yeah. you know means or whatever at least in most cases. Also, I love that the intelligence score to Flesh Golem is a six, meaning that you can feasibly yeah. create a player character that is dumber than a Flesh Golem. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a character rolled up like that once. Uh, it was my brother, and he stuck with it. Like, a lot of people would have just said, no, I'm not doing this. He continued to take that character and just make Shaggy. I like, and then uh, <laughs> became a Beastmaster Ranger so he could have his own Scooby. Oh. And his backstory oh, cool. was he was all pissed off because someone destroyed his food cart. And uh, <laughs> snacks. you, you, were, you yeah. just reminded so, me. Yeah, he was I, out uh, for revenge. <laughs> I uh, I was doing some some more things on the uh, my my One Piece character you know sheet for the upcoming campaign that we have, and I went ahead and I did my stats. Would you like to uh, Would you like to hear them? Ah, uh, yes. I, I think we're jumping the ball on uh, session zero there, but we're always kind of sloppy with that, honestly, in our crew. So, yeah. uh, and give us those stats, bud. I like to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for my Devil Forge, so what level are we starting at? Three, one. I can't remember. Hmm. What level are we starting at? We're starting at level one. Okay, cool. Just check. All right. So I got a I got a 17 for strength, 14 for constitution, 9 for dexterity, 12 for wisdom, 11 for intelligence and a 16 for charisma. All right. That'll work. Yeah. Yeah. Good scores. Not bad. With this being kind of like the uh the the hex blade-ish like build, yeah, it works. Spell casting is with the charisma. My ability score is a con plus one, strength plus two. Saving throws are wisdom and charisma. Not bad. 
I'm curious to see how this turns out considering you're going for like this whole uh fish man thing, but like uh yeah. very different. Like uh I hadn't even heard of the creature that you're basing it off of until you showed me. Oh yeah, the uh the Glaucus Atlanticus. <laughs> yes, also known as like what the the blue dragon of the sea. Yeah. It's a it's oh. a sea slug, but it's really cool looking. Oh. Looks, like a, looks like a little dragon. Right. Oh, that one is so cool. Yeah, I'm mixing. I have this idea of like an angler mixed with like that, you know. I love the pictures where they look so large, and then you see one on a fingertip. They're like, so oh, tiny. Yeah, pretty, pretty small. <laughs> honestly, they're they're just amazing to look at. Yeah. So you kind of get that bioluminescence uh, going mm-hmm. on, like exactly. Exactly. It's just wild. It looks like Pokemon. It, it really does. Does. It does. Yeah, that's just how the ocean is. <laughs> <laughs> you see the yeah. every week there's like, a new discovery in the ocean you're like what the uh-huh. hell is that mm. so you'll have like a, those little weird frills kind of uh, coming off of uh... maybe yeah uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes like probably see what we can come with an artist mm. but all right, I think that's a pretty good time to go into our descriptify well this week's descriptify I'm uh, we actually kind of dove a tiny bit into it at the start of the show right. with uh, the privy, uh, the old word for a toilet or a small uh, little bench with uh, holes that the people can use for toilet type uh, things. Uh, now, a lot of uh, castles uh, back in the old days uh, would have uh, their, their little privy set up like uh, up in the uh, on the ramparts where you could like just, you know, you go, you take a shit and it's like it's going to goes into like a little vat and then they would drop it on people that would try to invade the castle oh so could you imagine like a, your, your players try to uh you know raid a castle they're trying to break in and then just one of the soldiers just dumps a whole pile of shit on them <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> make a con save to keep from retching oh yeah there's also privy like according to a law a person having a part or interest in any action matter or thing. Yeah. And then an adjective sharing in the knowledge of something secret or private. Interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. you're privy to. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's like privy is almost like privacy. So like I could see where like the, <laughs> the word root is there. So it kind of doubles Out. up. <laughs> okay, so I didn't know privy was an outhouse. That's interesting. Yeah, it's more along the lines of just like a. If oh, you're this in... is why you were talking about toilets. Yeah, wow. yeah. Uh, in, a, in a lot of senses, it's like it's either a hole or like a bucket that you use for that kind of thing. Right, right. It's a poop poop uh, bucket. I, I've heard of people uh, taking uh, like a bucket and having the whole party uh, piss in it to make holy water. It's like <laughs> it we're, we're fighting a vampire, boys. <laughs> Pee in my bucket. <laughs> <laughs> well, at first you gotta you have to cast the thing to purify it to turn oh, it into it. holy water. All right, oh, man. <laughs> creative. You gotta bless it. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Lord, bless this piss. Hell yeah. That would be really interesting in a survival kind of campaign <laughs> with very little food and water. Like, don't worry, guys, I have purify. I don't worry, Here's guys. Food and drink works on piss. <laughs> don't worry, Bear Grills prepared me for this. Everybody, piss in this bucket. <laughs> Except for you, the Dragonborn. Don't piss in here. It'll be like acidic. <laughs> it's just for taste. Yeah. <laughs> just for taste. Yeah, good old Mountain Dew. That's how it's made. <laughs> oh, man, I saw the Hakune Miku Baja Blast <laughs> meme. Oh, is that a thing? <laughs> Wait, what? That's your name, Miku? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a meme that says uh, it's Kuni Mitsu's P is Baja Blast. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. <Huh. laughs> that won't stop me. Oh, <laughs> I like <man>. Baja. <laughs> they have to only make me to give more. <laughs> All right. Well, man. Well, I guess that kind of uh, leads us into our next segment. Generic Realm! Generic Realm! Lots of fun! Excellent! 
<laughs> yeah, it's always uh, sunny in the generic realms. Oh, yeah. And that's where we have. Um, let me just see if I can make it a little bigger on screen here. A little bigger than that. I present to you the, the living jar. Hell yeah. Now, the living jar, it, it's, it's very simple. It, a small construct. It, it's just a jar. It can be any kind of jar. An jar, AC of 10. Yeah, it's like maybe 12 hit points or so. It's got a speed of 15 and a swim feed of 10. That's a fast jar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll uh, send a picture to you right I'm here. At it right now. Oh, you are okay. Cool. Yeah. I forgot I sent that to you already. So it's uh, vulnerable to bludgeoning, fire, and slashing. Okay. Uh, the uh, <laughs> condition immunities: blind, uh, charmed, <laughs> deafened, exhausted, frightened, petrified, poisoned, or unconscious. <laughs> it's got vision. dark vision. What? what? <laughs> It knows all languages. So, so if you can recruit this living jar to your party, it might be good as a translator, apparently. Interesting. Now, the, the, the thing is, this is a jar, so its most notable feature is that it is fillable. Oh, God. So it, oh, no. And it actively seeks out people and asks them to have things stored inside it, like uh, potions, rations, acid, water, dirt. Please, fill me up. Put something inside me, please. Oh my God, please, I'm begging you. Yeah, exactly. They'll take anything, no matter how destructive or corrosive it is, and they'll store it just fine. Um, Please, please, master, fill me up. Uh, Let me hold the potion, master. So, uh, why does Reminds me of the game with the talking guns. (laughs) <laughs> name. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know the dude. one you're talking about. The one that, yeah, the one that people don't like because the guy that made Rick and Morty made it or something. Uh, people uh, always want to shit on uh, celebrities, and uh, whenever something uh, unfortunate happens to a celebrity, uh, there's a term for it: Schadenfreude. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like this guy. Uh, I, I do. I like this. I'm not sure what is going on with it, but I like it. <laughs> when you want to have an annoying little NPC that's also a useful item, but not like too abusable, I'm, I'm just th- not this sure. This is a good fit. Why, why has bl- uh, why has uh, dark vision? Why it knows all languages? <laughs> <laughs> I have questions. I got questions. <laughs> Recruit it to the party. Offer to fill it with juice or something. Fill it with piss. It, it would be happy to do so. The honorary piss jar. <laughs> I, I've heard of worse uses for jars, honestly. Oh, no. It was, it was longer than that. Nah, it's not the pony chair. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I feel like there's a lot of fun that could be had with a DM uh, that wants to do an annoying voiced characters. You know, I could see it. I could definitely see it. There's, there's just a lot here for so little. Keeping <laughs> in mind, I highly opinion, encourage people to try it out. I def- I give the jar. I give it a seven out of ten. Seven, seven d twenties out of. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? My, I, I would say yeah. The. uh the all languages known is kind of a big thing. Like, holy shit. If yeah. you manage to capture one of these and convince it to do stuff for you, the fact that it can hold a potion and move around is yeah. massive. You could, like, have it go to somebody who needs a potion. Like, that's really good, actually. It has a movement speed of 15 and a that's swim speed of 10. It's not bad at all. And, like, how I is, this, know how it, is it rolling? Is it hopping? Like, um. Uh, DM's choice. Yeah, I guess that's the DM's yeah. choice. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, Whatever makes the most sense for the voice. Right, right. Yes. It grows ghost <laughs> arms and scoots itself across the floor. <laughs> you can have this thing stalk your party after they leave a dungeon. Oh my god, it grows little legs. <laughs> uh, like one of those old cartoons where like the house oh, like lifts up its skirt god. and just walks away. Yeah, it's like <laughs> whenever you're not looking, it like grows little legs. <laughs> Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, the little walking sound. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right, it's moved up to an eight for me now. <laughs> <laughs> what do you All think, right. Goose? Would would your players uh, like a living jar? <laughs> um, I'm scared to give it to them because I know exactly how they're going to use it. As you should be. <laughs> they will find ways to abuse it. I mean, I love the flavor, but. If I allowed, like, um, in my game, languages are a big deal and you have to spend yeah. time to learn them. So if I were to give them a potion that knows all languages or a bottle yeah. that knows all languages, I could basically throw 90% of the prep I've done so far out the window. <laughs> oh, you can have it be like, while it's full, the the voice sounds like it's like underwater. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> I love that. But it's constantly Ooh. like, fill me, fill me. <laughs> maybe, maybe we take out the all languages known, uh, just, you know, as a campaign specific thing. And like oh, no. the language known will be common by default. And then one additional language based on what it's filled with. Oh, oh that would yeah. be amazing. I like yes. that. Oh, that's a good idea. Because there's like, okay. If you would fill it with holy water, it could speak celestial. Ooh, oh, man. Ooh, that see? Would be awesome that 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 serves the translation purpose yeah. while being more like we have to actively seek these things out like Instead okay like giant uh, we, we need giant. to speak like uh we need to speak infernal so we need to get our hands on like a very special type of acid yeah or maybe put like like fiend's blood in it or something like Ooh, yeah like a it to to know draconic you have to fill it with dragon's blood oh dude i like that Ooh. That's a, that's a cool item now. Now we're cooking. <laughs> yeah, that's that what I'm saying. Super cool. I like that. I I like how like if just that little tidbit takes it in a completely different direction and can kind of uh, motivate your players to like okay, if you are running languages as being a more prominent thing like Goose is, that's ex completely uh, changes the game there. Yeah. Oh, I, I might I add really, this to my game really now, like but idea, with that yeah. little change. Yeah, I really like yeah. the idea of like the what are depending on what's inside it. <laughs> maybe there's like extra effects, or maybe it can give you like the uh, the language for yeah, like, like a, a like a or something. I like the translation part because at the same time, you don't know uh, what the alignment is of this thing. Is it trustworthy? It could yeah. be very well out for its own devices. I mean, like, and I, I would imagine that'd be something you wouldn't know, too. Like, maybe you would drink, like, a potion of giant strength, right? Now, suddenly, you're speaking giant. Like, yeah, yeah. You could uh, fill it with a potion of giant strength, and then it knows, uh, then it knows Yotun. Or if yeah. you uh, put, like, water in it, now it knows Aquan, dirt, yeah. then it would know Terran. Exactly. I like that. I like mm. that. Maybe so graveyard dirt. With, would, I'm yeah, just graveyard remembering dirt. the Jack Sparrow. I've got a pot of dirt meme. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I got a job. Dude. Oh, I got a job. I got a job dude. Dude. Yeah. That's really cool. But it would be super cool to like give it its own personality, and then if yeah. you use it to translate it, make it maybe mistranslate things. Yeah. Oh yes, like have I mean, it be like a, a little unreliable in certain things. Yes. It's not, like all no, it's not that smart. It just knows language. It has an intelligence of eight. Yeah. So I mean it's basically as a child. So it might just give you the cliff notes. <laughs> yeah. Just because it knows a language, you're like, oh yeah, I've heard someone speak that before. Like, you know, I've heard it before, but I don't exactly like know what everything means. I mean, your charisma checks aren't exactly going to pass through this thing very well for yeah. negotiations. You're going to negotiate with a jar. Good luck. It, it's got a charisma of ten, so it's like okay, it, it can it can talk, but like it's a talking jar. All it wants is to be filled. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not broken, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, presumably not broken. 
All right. You can figure it and talk about mine now. <laughs> All right. I will present the Blackjack, a very rare Warhammer, versatile, requires attunement. This is a uh, large black hammer with like the head of like a black jack o' lantern. Looks pretty cool. It's a 1d8, yeah, 1d10, like plus two bludgeoning damage. Uh, with a dark iron, you gain a plus two to attack rolls you make with this weapon. As well as the ability Jack's Magic. This Warhammer has 10 charges. It regains 1d8 charges at midnight. You may expend charges to cast spells from the table below. For any saves a target has to make for these spells, DC is 14, or your spell save DC, whichever is higher. So for three charges, we got Hideous Laughter. For four charges, we got Entangle. Five charges, we have spe- uh, Fear. Six charges, we have a third level fireball. And nine charges, we have Hallow. I don't actually know what that spell is. Hallow. It sounds cool. Hallow spells. Hold on, let's see here. Hallow is a fifth level spell. 24 hour cast time until dispelled. You touch a point and infuse an area around it with holy or unholy power. The area can have a radius up to 60 feet. Oh, oh, you like create hallowed ground. Oh. Oh, that's cool. First, celestial elementals, fey, fiends, undead cannot enter the area, nor can creatures charm, frighten, or possess creatures within it. Oh. You can bind an effect to the area. Yo, this is kind of sick. Hold on, wait. <laughs> okay, courage. Affected creatures cannot be frightened. Darkness. Darkness fills the area. Daylight. Bright light fills the area. Energy protection. Very thematic. Oh, ah, I like it. I like this. Very multifunctional. You can do an aura of silence. You can do an aura of tongues. Interesting. <laughs> Back to translations. Yeah. This is a cool. I like this weapon. Yeah, it's pretty sick. Yeah, so, uh, I like the general, like the, the pumpkin by, uh, uh, head shape to it. Yeah. You know, it created by bonus action on Instagram and Patreon. So shout out to them. It's pretty cool. Oh, they got a Patreon. That's cool. They do. They do. Yeah. Looks like they have a, a whole kind of Halloween theme going on as well. I saw I that they like have a trick or treat daggers uh, that I'll probably talk about for next episode. Ooh, that'll be good. Oh. Yeah. I would love to see a complimentary paladin subclass to go along uh, with this. Like an yes. oath of fear or something like that. Yes. Because uh, like we we have oath of conquests and redemption. Yeah. Oath but, of the you know, pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oath of the spooky. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I'm trying to think of like a, a bet, like a really good way of putting it. Like, yeah, uh, hmm. it's on the tip of my tongue. Well, I'll think of it out after the show. <laughs> mm. well, yeah. What do you think of this? I give it a, I give it a good it seven. It's pretty cool. Yeah, you know what? Uh, uh, just because I like the whole thematicness of it and uh, just cool shape, I'll give it a uh, an eight. I, I like picture. It. Jack Skellington pulling this bad boy out. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I like, do I'm like f- that. Pumpkin King. The Pumpkin King. No, yeah. Yes, that's very good. <laughs> but yeah, that is all I have for this episode today. Mm, absolutely. Uh, speaking of Patreon. And uh, with Goose kind of uh, putting out a lot of his stuff for free, have you considered putting together a Patreon to kind of uh, for people to support your work? Um, Yes, I have. But um, right now, I don't think I put out enough content and I put out enough content consistently. Understandable. For it to be, you know, for it to warrant a Patreon. Right. Mm. So maybe kind of at some point in the future, I, I might consider it. But right now I'm just doing it for fun, basically. Mm-hmm. Right. And because I like putting stuff out there. And once I maybe get a bit of a following going, I might consider creating a Patreon. But that's all stuff in the future. For now, I just want to put stuff out there and I want to, you know, give it 
to the people basically mm -hmm. sounds and good where can uh, these if you people want to get more of a following uh yeah if he wants to get more of a following i might suggest uh twitter because the D, D community on twitter uh, they're always trying to bring each other up oh really it's yeah uh, i was very surprised oh. by that because like I'm, I'm not really a twitter guy but kind of had to for this sense of uh trying to promote the show a little bit yeah Oh, I hadn't even looked at Twitter, to be honest. I've just been posting my stuff on Reddit, but uh, if you put yeah. it that way. It's it's a wider audience, uh, for okay. sure. Well, in that case, I'll make a Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if you if you make a Twitter, we'll give you a follow, and uh, we'll share your stuff around. Uh, trust and believe, you'll, you'll get a following real quick with the quality of your content. Cool. Yeah, Thank you so much. Um, for anybody listening right now, I just heard... Um, I think Starboy talk about it. Oh, yes, um, yes. If you do want to follow me, I post my stuff on the Reddit under uh, the Goose Quill. Mm -hmm. Nice and obvious. Um, and I post stuff like maybe once every two weeks or so. Nice. All right. There you go, guys. Please check him Sounds out. Sounds great. It was great having you for hey. this episode. Nice yes, to meet you. Yes, thank you, you so much again. for inviting me. Yeah, you've been a wonderful guest. It was a lot of fun doing it. Absolutely. And if you want to come on the show sometime, uh, once uh, you feel uh, more up to kind of uh, let people uh, throw a little bit of uh, some tips your <laughs> way for uh, all your good homebrew, we'll have you back on. Sure thing. Sounds good. Yeah. All well, right. If we don't have anything else, I think that about wraps us up. Yep, I think that does. We'll be uh, back to our regular scheduled time next week, so... We will Everyone be uh, a posting a that. video, an episode on Halloween Grapes, I believe. Maybe a surprise for the viewers for that episode. Ooh, spooky. Uh, yeah. Spooky, scary uh, we, are, we got some stuff that we're working on, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully. those surprises will be coming soon. <laughs> if you guys don't see us on Halloween, we do hope you have a, an amazing holiday. Get candy, have fun with your friends, be safe. Mm. absolutely it's a busy time of year i know especially for me i got the four kids yeah man you with four kids i can only imagine all right we hope you all enjoyed this episode of dungeons and talk shows i am sam That's i'm orion <laughs> have a great weekend and have a great weekend see you next time <laughs>